Hello, I'm Andrea Tomazzi from Montpellier, and I have the honor to convene in this morning. So I would like to invite one of the main actors of the whole plate tectonic movie to come, Xavier Lepichon, that will present afterthoughts of a witness comparing the plate tectonics, evolution of a sudden freezing of supercooled Lake Ledoga in Caput of Curzio Malaparte. Thank you, and uh, good morning. I'm uh, first very grateful for the organizing committee and Eric Calais to organize such a nice meeting. Um, I started my research life 59 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I was going around the world on the Vima for sent by Maurice Ewing, I was supposed to... Do you hear me there? No. I, I was supposed to take care of uh, physical oceanography measurements. And, uh, but the purpose of the, this trip was to check the continuity of the mid-ocean ridge, especially in the Indian Ocean and south of Africa. And each time we were crossing the the, what we thought was the Rift Valley, uh, based on the earthquakes, mostly from a map of my former professor Rotte in Strasbourg, we would say, uh, we had it, you see. So that was the first time I, I discovered that uh, science could indeed be predictive. <laughs> we could find the ridge on the basis of the earthquakes. Um, this uh, led me to publish my first paper in Journal of Geophysical Research in 1960 about the deep water circulation in the Southwest Indian Ocean. So that's another story. But um, this, through this long research life, uh, I met many wonderful people and worked with many people that I cannot name there. I just want to mention three of them that uh, are not there anymore. I'm talking about Marcus Langfeld with whom I had a very nice uh, working life in, while in Lamont, uh, with uh, my friend Jean Franchetot in, uh, in France. And that was quite, quite, uh, quite a, 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 a nice life. And then finally with Jean Iyama in, uh, in Japan, with whom I could carry this uh, wonderful cooperation with Japan. So, uh, as I mentioned in my title, uh, thinking about the, the plate tectonics, I'm, I got more and more convinced that what happened was something similar to what uh, Malaparte has described in his book, uh, in his book ab about the, the, the horses of Lake Ladoga. Caput, the book is Caput. Uh, he was at the time a correspondent of, uh, of Italy, a representative of Italy in the war between uh, German and the Soviet Union. And they were around Leningrad and there was the big siege. And some people had put fire to the forest and all the horses had jumped into the lake and suddenly the lake that was below uh, freezing water but had not yet frozen, the lake froze instantaneously. And here are the horses, supposedly, that uh, were completely, immediately stopped. Now, what to me, uh, what it says is uh, quite uh, simple, that uh, I consider that in the 60s, earth sciences were in a super cool state and that uh, anything could lead to the solidification of the new paradigm anytime, anywhere. But of course, mostly where you had the proper data and you were at the proper place and so on. Striking proofs of the existence of this super cool state was the independent proposal of the seafloor spreading uh, magnetic anomaly IDs by Fred Vine and Lawrence Morley in 1963, completely independently and without any contact. And the other was the, the application of spherical plate 
to kinematics uh, in 1967, first by Jason Morgan and then by Diane McKenzie. And I could multiply this kind of thing, but um, the, this, this is to be understood. You know, when you try to make history through uh, this did that and who did that and so on, you, you lack something which is very important, which is this, this super cool state in which the science were there, you know, and you knew you were in there and you were trying one way or the other and ex extraordinary excitement and so on. So I'm not going to make history because I think it's, it's uh, very difficult to do. And instead, I will choose two uh, uh, vignettes La, la, Malapart in his book, you know, he likes to do vignette and he gets his story to a series of vignette, like, like uh, this uh, horses thing. The first one will be this, about this article I uh, published uh, 50 years ago in Journal of Geophysical Research. And then, then I will come back on something which, why did I fail to get it before, based on, on heat flow. So let, let's first start with the, the first thing. And uh, uh, I need to put the context now. And that is a, a fairly important, that's something you cannot in general explain. Uh, when I wrote the paper, I was in Lamont, and I had been for nearly five years. But I had already decided by June 1967 that I will, would leave uh, uh, the United States and go back to France. Now, that was a very difficult decision. Uh, at the time, France was out of this field of science. Uh, my friend Jean Aubrin was telling me on the phone the other day, uh, the geology at the time was a geology of France and the colonial empire, you know. And they were within these boundaries and with very little discussion with the outside. And I think that was very true, especially in view of the fact that there was no real deep sea oceanography to speak of. So the, the situation of France with respect to this development was rather hopeless. Uh, it's not a problem of scientists, it's a problem of the, the conditions were not there. And I thought that I could do something to change that. <laughs> well, I was 31, I was probably quite presumptuous, but uh, that, that led to my decision to come back to France. I went to Institut Physique du Globe, of course, of Paris, because that's the place to go. And uh, I was turned down. The, the, the reason was that uh, Roland Schlich was in charge of marine geophysics. And there could not be two Roland Schlich. That was too much. So uh, the, the, the uh, next thing, I, I, I was offered a position in physical oceanography by... Uh, Lacombe, Professor Lacombe, Museum d'Histoire Naturelle, but I wanted to do geophysics. So he told me I would talk to the new director, of, president of CNEXO. And at the time, they were trying to, to start a new oceanography. And in, especially, they had the intention to build what is now the Centre Oceanologique de Bretagne that you see here. You see Brest in the background, a huge thing now. Is, probably more than 1,000 or 1,500 people in place. But uh, of course, at the time, that was that. When I arrived, uh, there was a farm and uh, the sea around. And uh, I remember I was there for the, the first stone, you know, where you put your first stone. And I was next to the farmer that had been kicked out. And the, the minister was saying, that's a wonderful thing that this place with these arid lands and very poor lands and so on. And he pushed me and told me that's the best land of the country. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, I was there, you know, and I had to start. And by October, I had this prefab that was put to put my computer and start working. But you kind, you kind of see that having been to see uh, the director, the president of CNEX, so, and telling him he wanted to do just a logistic base and, and a technological base. And I told him, I agree to come as your scientific advisor for our sciences, but the condition would be that you start a multidisciplinary uh, research center. And he agreed. 
And he said you would have to put it together with the guy um, who was for biology, which was Lucien Lobier, who is not there anymore. So uh, I decided to go, and my hope was to make a new Lamont. So you see the kind of thing I had in the head uh, while I was working on this paper. This, this is the context. Then the next thing is, uh, uh, while I was in France, my wife was still in, in the States because the, the academic the school year was not finished. And, um, and she sent me this article of the New York Times by Walter Sullivan. It was a, a full page describing the paper that will come the following month in the Journal of Geophysical Research, the, the Continental Drift paper, this uh, sea floor spreading and continental drift. And he focused actually on the reconstruction I made uh, for the, the world at the time. It's interesting that this paper is now recognized only for the, the uh, six plates model and the ki present kinematics, but that's what focused him anyway. And she sent me this, this article, but when I received it, actually, I had another type of revolution under the hands. I was living just next to this barricade of May 1968, 10 meters from that. This is in Rue Gay-Lussac. I was in Rue des Feuillantines, 10 meters away, and uh, we thought a revolution was coming, but not the same time. So all this to explain that uh, I was living in a very different context. And when I did my research for this paper, actually I was thinking of the following thing, but knowing that I could not exploit this paper in the following years. I often say that my exclusive source for the seafloor spreading paper was Jason Morgan extended outline and this has been said, and his message, which is, this is how to quantify the relative motion of plates. As soon as I received the, this, the small uh, outline that he sent to the uh, 10 people, I immediately started working on it. I was actually the only one. Nobody else got interested, apparently, by what Jason did. I think that that's also an interesting point, you know, he presented it to quite a few people. Uh, the room was full, more than here. More, more people, I mean. And, and uh, nobody was interested. And uh, the concept was too new. You know, at the excitement at the time, we could map the edge of the seafloor. That was the real excitement at the time. Well, I went to my colleagues in Lamont, and they were not interested in working with me. And that came to this strange thing that, for the first time in Lamont, after five years, I would do a paper alone. My physical oceanography, I was alone. But this, I would do a paper alone in, in uh, Earth sciences, because nobody wanted to work with me. They were too busy with these magnetic anomaly things. And uh, so I worked during seven months alone. And I think I opened three new, five, three new uh, lines. One was the demonstration of the absence of Earth expansion. At the time, well, that was important. Quite a few people still believed in Earth expansion. Um, Hazen at Le Monde was very much for Earth expansion. The second thing is uh, the closure of the Earth plate circuit and the first global model, which, of course, was testing the, the rigidity of the Earth, and the third were the first finite reconstruction that were mentioned by Walter Sullivan. Um, the, my data, there were 31 seafloor spreading anomalies measured, and there were fracture zone, and this is what I did to obtain the, the uh, actual geometry of opening, quantify the opening in, in five oceans. But uh, I used the Mercator, the oblique Mercator uh, thing to test the fact that uh, with the fracture zone you would have when you are in the, at the pole of opening this, uh, uh, the, the, the fracture zone on, under the lines of latitude. And this is done for the South Pacific. Here it's a figure of the paper. And I used it actually to discuss the impossibility of Earth expansion. And this is seen here 
TLA, this is close to, to the, the, the actual, this pole is not very different from the actual Earth, Earth pole. And what you see is that you have a lot of opening in the east-west direction that you can quantify, and very little in the north-south direction. And then because of that, I could uh, show that if this had been going on for 100 million years, of course the Earth would have had at the time a shape which was completely out of hydrostatic equilibrium. So uh, Earth expansion was not possible. Um, then the next thing I did, the, I simplified the model and obtained the uh, global circuit model. And that was with a six plate and, and five opening and computing for the first time in the trenches. And uh, I obtained, for example, eight centimeters per year near Tokyo. And that was close to the, the actual measurement that was first measured by geodesy about uh, 20 years later. No, we are about 15 years later. Um, that raised an interesting question, which is coming now in the literature, which is uh, what is the minimum number of plates necessary to obtain global climatic closure? Is, does that have a sense? And uh, indeed, um, we know now that seven main plates cover 94% of the Earth, and they reflect the dominant wavelengths of convection. Mallard et al. in a recent paper in Nature have shown that this number of 67 is governed by the value of the elastic limit of the lithosphere. I don't want to, to go further in that, but it's an interesting point, I think, which is coming back to the surface now. And then finally, I did the first finite reconstruction. I discussed the fact that uh, when you add up uh, three uh, finite uh, rotations, uh, then uh, the, the pole of rotation, as you increase, the, this will progressively uh, change place. So th that implies a modification of the geometry of opening, and I discussed the geological consequences. I discussed the Atlantic opening. I showed that the, this implied that the Caribbean must have been created since 180 million years, between 180 and so on. I did for the Indian Ocean and so on. Okay, so that's it. I come to a second point, which is, uh, why did I fail to adopt seafloor spreading in my heat flow research, which was published with uh, Lang set as first author, myself, and Ewing in 1966? I put a quotation of John Sclater that I just, it's a mail he sent me on March 9 of this year, which is jean Franchot and I both believe that the model presented in the 1966 paper, written by Langfey, yourself and you, provided the spark that set off the whole plate tectonic revolution. And indeed, when I come back to this paper, I'm stunned by the fact that I did not jump on, on the seafloor spreading at the time. Uh, the, the model was very simple. I used it both for uh, rising lithosphere, rising uh, mantle flow and then going uh, laterally with symmetry at the axis, constant temperature at the bottom. And I did the same for the trenches. And um, I quote from the paper, in seafloor spreading, the crest of the ridge always reaches the same height provided that the velocity is larger than 0.5 centimeter per year. And this is indeed something very interesting that I worked on later on, so quite a few other people, that below 0.5 centimeter per year, the conduction becomes too important and you don't get the same type of uh, seafloor spreading. And the second thing, whereas the slope of the flank only depends on the velocity. You know, I, I, I had it, and you can see it on the top, uh, you see the, the topography of the ridge produced by this uh, contraction, and you see also the heat flow, and you see the excess temperature. So if I had simply, instead of putting my emphasis on the heat flow, uh, look at the topography and say, does it fit the topography, seafloor spreading? The answer would have been yes. Of course, I had forgotten to put the isostatic uh, rebound thing, but that changes suddenly about... 25, 30%. Uh, I had looked at the problem at, at what it would do on the fusion curve and how much fusion there would be in the ascent and so on. And then 
Finally, I look at the trenches. I show that it would produce, simply the contraction would produce a depression of two kilometers at least, that the, the heat flow would go to zero. And I even mentioned in the paper, uh, one should record ni zero heat flow landward of the trench. No other mechanism than seafloor spreading can produce such a low heat flow. And I said that would be a test. And yet, I decided that it did not fit the heat flow uh, energy test because uh, I obtained, we, we did a very sophisticated work there on uh, seeing whatever the correction were necessary for topography and for uh, sedimentation. We said it could not explain the difference. And, and we found that for one centimeter per year, for example, we obtained 1.6, whereas you should have had 3.1 um, microcalorie per centimeter and so on. And then uh, for the, the, the uh, EPR, 2.5, but actually the, the seafloor spreading there was 1.6 and 3. So the difference was about a factor of 3. There was a 3 gap, and I decided because of that that this was not possible. And it's very interesting. I've pondered that very often, that uh, Dan McKenzie, uh, one year later, when he found that, because he was convinced that seafloor spreading existed anyway, he just used an artifact and, and dropped the temperature of the asthenosphere from 1500 to 550 degrees centigrade. And then, of course, he obtained the proper heat flow. You can see the two different attitudes of people who had a different frame of mind and who were not looking at the same thing. One was convinced that there was seafloor spreading. He Jump over. He knew that the atmosphere was not 550 degrees, but it did not matter. And, and the other one uh, was said, I cannot ignore this misfit in the heat flow, and he did not look at the, at the temperature, at the uh, topography. Okay, so that produced a crisis uh, which was very useful for my future, future research work to understand that uh, I was actually, uh, I could fail. I mean, in science, you can fail. And then the other tell you, you have failed, and you have to change. And that is a very sobering, humiliating, but sobering uh, experience. So uh, when I came back from my thesis in France, which was uh, celebrated as a very good thesis, uh, I discovered the magic profile of Pittman and that I was completely wrong and I had to readjust everything and that was it. Now let's go to my return in France and my next step. I had, did not have the data anymore, so I wanted to work on the theory. And that's this time where I did work on, on the theory with uh, jean Francheteau and Jean Bonin for the aspect of geology. He was coming from Montpellier very good school of geology, so structural geology. And um, we did this book, Plate Tectonic, uh, that was published in 1973. And I was, it was very well received, and I think most of the people use it. Some people called it at the time the Bible, anyway. So it was very useful, but it was useful for me. Um, and, uh, well, I mentioned this, but I, I like very much this. Uh, this thing in a review by Fred Vine. I find it virtually impossible to find fault with this book. Now that, that I was so happy to read that. <laughs> he, he was very kind, but uh, still it helps when you are in this situation where you try to build something new and you see, well, I was not able to continue on, on the data I, I did not have anymore, but I could do this piece on theory. And the book then led to, first we discussed the lithosphere, mostly based on the idea of El Sacer, that, that not to mention now, but were very important at the time. And then the kinematics of the North Atlantic Ocean, because uh, we had this, a, 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 in 1969, a, a, a cruise in the North Atlantic to look at the fracture zone that was very important for the finite reconstruction. Then I went to the accretion plate boundary, and we, with the American, we, we have this famous project in 73, 74, 
Then I went to the consuming plate boundary. That's exactly the, the program I have, I have in my book, uh, which was consuming the trench of heat, the trench of uh, the Hellenic arc, and Kaiko, the trench of Japan. And finally, I went to continental tectonics, um, and I chose a place which was sufficiently close to a trench to have some information from the consuming plate boundary itself. So I want to move to something else, uh, which is uh, things I have been thinking about for three years now. But um, and the, the question is, did plate tectonics change from Pangaea to present? Well, many people have discussed the fact that plate tectonics has changed and did not exist probably in the early years. And when did that change occur? And so on. I want to talk here about a change which is more recent. And um, maybe that uh, the style of tectonics and the, the whole system was different during the first part of Pangaea and, and uh, the first uh, uh, dispersal of Pangaea, first part of dispersal of Pangaea to the present. This came out of a paper that we have now submitted to the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. I did with... Uh, Jilal Schenger and Chandler Himayen. Um, let, let me just start with, with how, how I started this thing. Uh, the, this is just the, the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, and uh, the Apulian plate extension. These small circles are uh, what we believe to be transform fault. Uh, that were active in Jurassic time, just during the opening of Pangaea. And, and what I, I want to, to uh, point out first is that uh, many geologists have been puzzled by this problem, which is that at the same time, they like the idea of Argon and quite a few people since then, which say that this Apulian promontory has been very important for the formation of the Alps. So it was there when the Alps were formed. And uh, yet, uh, the, the, the problem is that the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean Sea had then to be present when this happened. It had to be there to form the promontory. And, and the problem is that we know now that the, at least the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea was formed in um, early uh, Jurassic. And that is a contradiction. And our uh, proposal is that actually this is because it was a, a very large pull apart, a, a strike slip zone, uh, along which there was extension and production of basins at the same time maintaining this promontory. This is shown here in uh, this scheme for the opening in 175 million years ago. 1300, the, the blue circle, is the direction of motion between Africa and Europe. And the actual direction are given in red. And you see that the Apulia system is acting as a pull apart. And as that, it's still linked to the north, to the transform fault to the north, and is extended you produce extension and you produce the Mediterranean Sea. At least that's what we propose. Uh, this came from the fact that when you look at the geological data in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, this blue line is the, is the, uh, let me see how does that work. Oh no, it's somewhere here. This blue line is a, a well-known a transform fault that was active at the time. And these are faults that were active, all that by extension producing this basin between Trias, end of Triassic and Calovian, 163 million years. Now, if you look more carefully at the gravité, for example, this is the gravité, you see that this line that follows the the transform fault that has been mapped geologically here. Actually, you can follow it and it extends and it gets along the, it gets along the, the present 
uh, Tyrrhenian uh, deep, deep slab that is going there and it's exactly along the extension. So that suggests indeed that uh, you have this former trans transform fault. Sorry. that have been uh, active then and are not anymore. Uh, by the way, uh, what we showed also in this paper is that by using the very nice uh, folds that have been mapped on top of the Hellenic slab uh, by uh, Saxpazi and their colleagues, you see these white things here, if you retract this subduction using this guide, you end up roughly along the present EMNT transform fault there, and you restore this whole oceanic system. So let me continue. Now, if I put it in a merc oblique mercator with respect to this pole, what I have is, is indeed rather spectacular. The whole system there goes from the Eastern Mediterranean, and if you extend this, because that goes down to 500 kilometers here, it comes about to here that the whole thing is just a continuous uh, system of presumably oceanic or partly oceanic, partly continental extension. And in here you have extension in part within the Apulia system and presumably uh, oceanic there. Why was there such a remarkable geometry? And I was very surprised by that. And uh, looking at the, the only example I could, rim, could compare to, which is the Caribbean uh, Cayman Truff. Uh, this is from Man, a paper from Man. You see the remarkable uh, system there, which has been active between 57 and present. And you see the magnetic anomaly. You see how the magnetic anomaly are distributed with an axis of symmetry there and going on both sides. Uh, and what is what is interesting, a little bit more, I think, because I think I started. Let me give eight minutes. Okay, then, then uh, having that, uh, what, what you had before was the Caribbean flood uh, system. It was uh, 90 million years ago, a huge system that covered this whole place with basalt with a thickness of 15 to 20 kilometers. And I'm really wondering whether this had not an effect to allow such a remarkable uh, kinematics in, in this. So I looked at the, at the Pangea, and this I used the paper I did with uh, Philippe Huchon uh, in 1984. We were focused on the fact that in this Lambert Equaloria, all the continents of Pangea fit within one hemisphere, which is a continental hemisphere, with just this part of status. And what you have here in uh, blue, these are the future breaks. These are the direction perpendicular, where well, the radius of the cycle, where presumably, because there was subduction around the main compression with this direction, which presumably influenced the type of fractures. But what I want to point out is this huge thing, which is the camp, Central Atlantic, uh, magmatic uh, province, huge thing which came out 201 million years ago. Now this camp was actually preceded by during 30 million years, uh, starting in Carnian Orion by a fracturing, overall fracturing is very visible here in particular, but not only here, but all the way along the future break that will be induced by the motion of Africa away. Uh, this is true in Morocco, Spain, Alps, uh, Apennine, Levant, uh, Southern Anatolia, and so on. So 30 million years of fracturing, and then this huge outpouring. Now this outpouring is there, but then when you look, the next opening, which will be the opening between uh, South America and Antarctica, uh, the Kau one, 183 million. And then you move to uh, the break between South America and, uh, and, and uh, 
um, Africa, the Parana one, 132, and you have the break between India, Australia, Antarctica, 120 million, and then finally the break between Madagascar and India, and between 90 and Madagascar and Mascara and 66 million years ago. And then you have this isolated event that I take as a trial that did not go anywhere, uh, which was the Siberian trap. But that is quite remarkable, a huge amount of volcanism. And I, I'm suggesting that it implied a different type of uh, mechanics and tectonics. Uh, then if we look at the at the uh, 125 million years ago, that's again from Le Pichon and Huchon, uh, what you have there is the first stage where you have just opening in North Atlantic and Indian Ocean, and that produces, we are still within the hemisphere, but what it does is push the system around to close the Tethys. But this is the, roughly between 125 and 80 million years, there was a big break, a major change, uh, which is seen here in the kinematics of the Europe with respect to Africa, that's from Rosenbaum. Europe is fixed and the motion of Africa is shown by these traces, for example, for this point with respect to this point. The motion is first like that, pure strike slip to about 100 million years, at least that's what we propose, and then change to uh, oblique and collision and finally pure collision after 65, 50, 55 million years. The main thing is that at 100 million years there is a major change all over the Earth, uh, which is the Albion, and we enter into a new system in which the Earth changes its configuration and it did comes to the present configuration where most of it is outside of the, a good part of it is outside of this great circle, it has really broken apart. Now, this we link to the geoid, but I, what I want to point out is the negative of the geoid. You see, here is in, this is the part where India would be. And indeed, when you look at the Indian Ocean, you see this 90s ridge, and here I have put it in the position where the pole of this system is over there. That's the one, the pole of the geoid. And you see it fits exactly along this 90 thing east, and you have uh, the Chagos Lakadiv, which does about the same thing. So looking at recently at a paper by Claude, uh, at a, an atlas by Claude Rangin that is uh, in publication, he asked me to do the preface. What I discovered was first that this part here, where you had the Rajmal and the opening, uh, was a part which was enormous amount of flood basalt that are present all over uh, this uh, Bay of Bengal now on a very big thickness and which happened 120 million years ago. The second thing is that the 90 East Ridge, most of the people take it to turn around here. This is a gravity map. But actually what you have here is the bulge, the outer bulge of the subduction. So the, the ridge actually goes below uh, the Andaman uh, Islands and then goes over there and enters there, as you see the same, and stops about here. So the ridge has been present since 120 million years, and it has been all along the same direction. This is shown on this map where I have taken the pole of the geoid, so that is the negative is on the outside, uh, and this is the 90 east, and this is the small circle, actually nearly a great circle, 87 degrees, with respect to this pole. This has been produced between 120 million years and about 30 million years ago when you had the opening between Australia 40, 30, 40, Australia and Antarctica. Same thing for Chago Sagadiv from the Deccan 67 million years ago to about 40 million years ago. Same sm small circle, 67, 87, about the same system. The negative is mostly in there. And uh, you notice that you extend the line, you hit the two extremities of the uh, Indian thing. So there is a clear relation with, it, with India. And if I look, I'm sorry about this old slide coming from uh, 
the paper with Yushon, but this is the present configuration I continue with the geoid on top. What I want to outline is this negative here, ignore the owl, and the big bl black things here are these two lines, the 90 east, the Chago Sagadiv, they fit exactly a small circle about that. And notice that it is slightly oblique and, and in, with respect, it's not zero, zero, it's uh, six north and four east, and it fits the, the, the 90 east, which is also inclined. So, to conclude, and uh, you will be happy, I'm concluding. Uh, the, the, uh, the, I, I want to, to point out this again. We had a system which was clearly controlled by something. We have proposed that it was the geoid. We can discuss that. But it was controlled by something. That led to a huge outpouring of magma after the a 30 million years period of fracturing. That was not distributed haphazard. It was made in such a way that it could indeed produce the motion of the of the continent first to close the Tethys. And then when that was nearly done to explode out of this small circle. So there must have been a deep uh, uh, control. I think we have to, to turn to, to understand what was the control of what happened. And the second thing, we have to realize that this huge outpouring of volcanism, um, uh, which is related to the dispersal of Pangea change the mechanics of the system and that we are dealing with special types of mechanics that are not present at the time. So I think we still have work to do and I thank you.